It is what autocrats and dictators do when they don't like the message. They shut down or get rid of the messengers. And that is exactly what is happening now in Belarus. The coverage of mass protests has gained traction and attention globally to the dismay of President Lukashenko. The result is now good. It's not good news for foreign journalists. DW's Nick Connolly joins me in just a moment. He was just forced to leave Belarus. But first, his report on efforts to gag the media and what that means for the protest movement. Weeks of protests, capturing imaginations around the world. Colorful symbols, charismatic leaders. It's often turned ugly, security forces cracking down brutally on peaceful protests. And when it did, photographers and journalists were there to report it. People here tell you one thing time and time again. Knowing that the world is watching makes them feel safer. They're sure the outside attention acts as a restraint on the government. But Belarusian journalists are facing increasing intimidation. Two photographers spent 15 days in jail for, quote, organizing an illegal protest. They had taken pictures of a demonstration. An editor who published an interview in which a victim of torture names his torturer also ended up in jail. Entire news outlets now stand to lose their media licenses. Without them, their journalists could face arrest at any time. Foreign journalists like me haven't so far been subjected to this kind of treatment. But very soon, there may not be any of us left here in Belarus. Getting a new accreditation or extending existing papers is no longer possible. There's no outright refusal, just the same excuse over and over again. The commission in charge, they say, can't get together because of COVID. This in a country where the man in charge President Alexander Lukashenko, who claims to have won the disputed election, downplays the dangers of the coronavirus. He has said that a visit to the sauna is the best treatment for the disease. As independent media here vanishes, protesters fear a future in which there is no one left to document what the government does to its opponents. And with me here at the big table is DW's very own Nick Connolly. Nick just got off the plane from Minsk. Nick, it's good to see you. Uh, talk to me about what has happened here. Basically, you had no choice, right? You had to you had to leave the country. You didn't have your accreditation anymore. Not just me. This is something that's affected uh, basically all of the foreign press. Um, I happen to have this paperwork from last year. It was running out, and every time I tried to renew it, I was told, unfortunately, the commission in charge can't meet because of COVID. Um, not a very convincing argument in a country where the president says, go to the sauna if you have COVID or ride a tractor to make yourself healthy again. So that's something, an excuse that's been peddled to not just us, but to all the main international media. And basically in a few weeks time, there's going to be no one left. Well, right. They're, they're just letting everyone's accreditation run out. And then there'll be no foreign journalists left. That is the plan. Um, what about the local journalists there that you know and that you've worked with? I mean, are, are they in, are in danger? And are they even going to be able to make a living with, with this crackdown widening the way it is? They're very definitely in danger. I was at one of the women's marches just last weekend and one of the local Belarusian journalists was taken in. She had an accreditation. She was working, clearly identifying herself as a journalist, wearing a, a, a high-vis jacket. And she was given 15 days in jail for, quote, organizing a, no, participation in an illegal demonstration and for um, not cooperating with the police. She was also slapped with a big fine and but essentially, if she's going to lose her accreditation, she will be banned from working in her own country. The country's biggest news service, Tukbai, has been taken off, uh, basically has been blocked for now for three months. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of warning shot across the bows. And basically, yeah, it's going to be a situation where it's going to be state media in the country and all other media will be forced into exile, as has already happened with several outlets. Were you sensing the, the, the pressure here? I mean, did, did, did you feel unsafe? I didn't feel unsafe personally. I think as a foreigner, we are privileged in the situation. And I think it's kind of uh, difficult to uh, complain when we've, I've seen much worse stuff happen to locals who have a lot more to, at risk and who obviously need to carry on living in this country and would you know, potentially face exile if this continues. I definitely felt that I was being watched. We occasionally had people walking past, making their presence felt, just to kind of give us a sense that we were being watched. I was filmed at multiple occasions. Mm -hmm. um, that was definitely a strategy to make us feel like we weren't uh, you know, uh, in a free situation to do what we wanted. We've got about a minute left. I want to ask you, leaders of the opposition, 
Um, they've left the country, Belarus. Now we've got media coverage that's being stopped. I mean, it looks like Lukashenko, he's not giving an inch. Definitely. He doesn't see anything in it for him to engage in any kind of dialogue, but I'm not sure it's totally up to him. He has become a liability for the Russians. The optics are just too toxic. At the moment, they have him where they want him. He is being forced to make concessions and essentially give up Belarusian sovereignty in return for Russian support against his own people. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, the most kind of memorable thing was that the police, with all the weapons at their disposal, all their massive um, superiority in terms of power, they were not willing to stand on the streets and protect the regime without balaclavas. Mm -hmm. As soon as the protesters came and ripped their balaclavas off, they ran away from the protesters. They are not willing to show their face mm -hmm. and put their face to that regime. So I think he has problems brewing. For now, he might be safe, but he definitely um, has problems ahead and is going to pay a price for this Russian support. Well, we're glad you're safe, Nick. Um, and we appreciate your reporting. Glad that you could come in and tell us about it tonight. Glad that the flight was safe tonight as well. <laughs> Nick Connolly, thank you, Nick. The standoff in Belarus is high on the agenda at an EU summit that's about to get underway in Brussels. European leaders are gathering for two days of talks about foreign affairs. Our Brussels correspondent, Barbara Vazel, is covering that summit for us. Barbara, can we expect the EU to take any action on Belarus? They're not going to take action, but they will be desperately trying to resolve the problem about the Belarus sanctions. They were left shamefaced when 10 days ago the foreign ministers agreed on sanctions against about 40 members of the regime in Minsk. And then one country got up and said, no, that is Cyprus. Cyprus is blackmailing the European Union at this point. They are linking sanctions they want against Turkey to the sanctions against Belarus. Those two things have nothing whatever to do with each other. But that is the situation. And now European leaders have the difficult task of reassuring Cyprus and telling them we are by your side. But could you please, please let those Belarus sanctions go ahead? There's no shortage of challenges, Barbara, for EU leaders at the moment. What else is on their summit agenda there today? If you look at the map, Terry, it's little fires everywhere, all around the borders of the European Union. Uh, just take Azerbaijan, Armenia, the military conflict uh, that had f uh, flared back into life uh, as one example, and Turkey has its fingers in that conflict too. Then, of course, there is the main act, this uh, big uh, standoff between Greece, Cyprus and Turkey, supported uh, Greece and Cyprus supported by some Western allies and Turkey pushing aggressively into the eastern Mediterranean with its drilling vessels. That has almost led to military tension, tensions between NATO members. France was involved. Now everybody is trying to defuse this. And the question is, will there be sanctions or won't there be? Paris is adamant that Turkey really needs to be threatened now, that Turkey doesn't understand the diplomatic language and needs a sort of very solid threats put on the table. Other countries, particularly Germany, are trying to defuse uh, the escalation and say we need to sit down and talk and get to a solution with Turkey. It is a very difficult thing to deal with and it's not yet clear where it will go. Okay, that conflict between Turkey and Cyprus in the Eastern Mediterranean is just one of the problems uh, with that country. Relations with Turkey are strained in multiple ways. What's the EU's overall strategy in dealing with Turkey? If the EU would have a strategy, they'd probably be a lot more relaxed and a bit happier. Uh, they're not united on this. It, it is the big problem that there are different camps in, within the European Union in several foreign policy questions. They don't speak with one voice. Uh, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel just recently admonished her colleagues and said, we need to get together more on foreign policy, otherwise nobody will take it seriously. But uh, there is the camp that is more aggressive like France and Austria and some others, Greece, of course, and say we really need to sort of push Ankara back. We need to show them that uh, we can't be dallied with like this. And others who, who say we, the, the hardline approach uh, doesn't lead anywhere. We need to talk to them, engage them and tell them that it is in their uh, advantage to deal with us in, in a peaceful manner. So those two camps will sort of battle it out at the conference table tonight here in Brussels. Barbara, thank you very much. DW's Barbara Vazel in Brussels.